Hi, my name is Abby Perry and I'm an extension educator in the southeast part of the state. I'm based out of Carbon County and I, um, I'm going to talk today about tree selection and planting. I thought that this would be a pertinent topic based on the conversations that I've had with some of my constituents in Carbon County, um, questions that come up, yard calls that I've been on, that sort of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and open my PowerPoint. Um, real quick and we can go ahead and get started. So um, I've called this presentation Right Tree, Right Place and it's focusing on tree selection and planting. This could be um, a much, much longer presentation than what I'm going to go into. Um, sometimes even just that site preparation, um, getting ready for a tree, selecting the right spot, that in itself can be a long discussion that I'm just, I'm not getting into today. Um, like I said, this is just based on um, challenges that I've seen repeatedly with clientele. So um, this image is of a bald and burlap tree, so sometimes called a B&B, &B, where the root ball is covered in burlap and then it's within this wire cage. And I have found that people will call me out to their place, I go out to visit, um, they'll tell me that the tree, their tree was really nice and healthy for maybe three years, four years, and then just something changed. And now it looks terrible, it's not doing well, it's died back. Um, and they want to know what's wrong. And when I start asking questions, you know, sometimes that, well, how often is it being watered and, um, you know, fertilized, whatever, uh, we find out uh, that it was either planted in uh, burlap or it's still in its wire cage. Sometimes the trees are planted too deep, but most of the time the problem comes back to there's still burlap around the tree. So um, where I'm at in Carbon County, a lot of clientele will go to Colorado to buy trees from um, greenhouses or nurseries in Colorado. And what you can get away with in Colorado isn't necessarily what you can get away with in Wyoming. So um, you might be able to leave the burlap on the tree and it break down in the soil there. But in Wyoming, we just we can't do that. It doesn't break down fast enough and it makes it so that those roots aren't um, getting out into that native soil and picking up water and nutrients like they should be. So about that three year mark where they're, you know, past that root mass and really ready to explore, um, they can't because of that burlap barrier or wire cage barrier. And um, so it's really important that all of that burlap and all of that wire cage be removed. Um, sometimes these root balls are huge and it's impossible to, you know, get all of the burlap or all of the wire cage. But what we're trying to do is have as much um, surface contact with the root ball to um, soil as we possibly can. Um, as I mentioned, one of the other things that happens is sometimes that the trees are planted too deep. And so this is either that um, they're planted too deep and that there's soil up around the tree trunk or sometimes that there's mulch that's resting against the tree trunk. And what's um, dangerous or challenging about that is that when that soil gets wet or that mulch gets wet, it rests against that tree trunk and basically just creates a vulnerable spot on the tree. So either a rot um, spot or where disease and fungus can um, seep in. This Actually this last spring um, in a part of the county we had a big windstorm and I had a picture sent to me of a tree that was basically just snapped off at the ground and we figured out that there was a weak spot there because the tree had been planted too deep and that soil had just sort of weakened the trunk and made it so that it wasn't quite as stable as it normally would be. Um, so here's a nice diagram of proper planting instructions or yeah proper planting diagram. Um, it's great to make your hole wider than your root ball, but we don't ever want to make it deeper. As I just mentioned, the challenges with having it deeper and having things rest against that tree trunk or tree bark. Um, when we make it wider, you know, about two times wider is um, good to shoot for. Um, we want to make sure that when we're making it wider, we don't accidentally loosen up that soil on the bottom because we want to make sure that that root mass has a firm um, bed to kind of sit down or sit against. Uh, when we start watering the tree, we don't want it to sink and then create that um, deeper planting problem like I mentioned. 
This diagram also shows the ridge of soil that we want to have around right around the drip line of the tree. So if you kind of drew a line from the edge of the leaves straight down, that's kind of the drip line on the ground. And we want to build up a little ridge there to help hold water so that when we're watering trees, um, that water doesn't just run off away from the tree, that that ridge kind of, um, or that well kind of holds it in place and lets that water sink into the tree and not to whatever is surrounding it. Um, something else when I'm getting called out to look at trees is um, just common diseases and in insects and I tend to see those the most with aspens and cottonwoods. So here's um, just a screenshot of one of our barnyards and backyards articles on um, well, it's, a, it's called Aspen's Cottonwoods Prone to Problems. There, when you go to that Barnyards and Backyards website, um, I guess I should mention Barnyards and Backyards is a quarterly publication that uh, we put out, has usually nine to 10 different articles in it targeted for small acreage, um, horticulture and gardening. There's usually um, an article for everyone. And about a year after those articles are published, they become available online. And so on um, this particular article, the Aspens and Cottonwoods Prone to Problems is available online to look at. So if you go to the Barnyards and Backyards website, there's all sorts of different categories. And under landscaping, you can find information about trees. And there's all sorts of trees for windbreaks, um, trees that are appropriate for um, the region, um, yeah, all kinds of great stuff there on trees. So some of the common problems that I um, I see with these aspens and cottonwoods, cottonwoods in particular, I see quite a few with these unhealed wounds. Um, what I imagine are from pruning. Uh, a tree can heal a pruning wound from like that has the same diameter of a quarter, you know, pretty well, maybe even the diameter of like a softball pretty well. But when we, when we start talking about pruning off a branch that was maybe the size of like um, a dinner plate, it just becomes harder for that tree to heal. And so we see a lot of that red um, or orange kind of discoloration on the trunk, seeping, oozing. And if the tree is water stressed, then it makes that um, oozing even worse. Um, another problem that I see quite a bit is the aphids. I think sometimes as um, gardeners, we just accept aphids for what they are, but I have been called out um, to landowners places where they have businesses and the aphids in the trees create a lot of honeydew and then there's a lot of dripping on like vehicles and just creating a sticky mess and so people want to treat those aphids and I've just found that they tend to be in aspens and cottonwoods more than some of our other trees. Uh, the oyster shell scale so this is a little insect that's under a hard shell covering common on um, aspen trees. It's one that's um, more difficult to treat just because of how extensive it can be up into the canopy and sometimes like um, actually physically removing each little scale is the best way to treat it and it's just difficult to get into the canopy of the tree. There are also some dormant um, like oils that you would apply with the when the tree was dormant horticulture oils that um, work well as well. Um, I don't think I mentioned yet, but aspens and cottonwoods also tend to need lots and lots and lots of water. If we think about where we see aspens, or I mean uh, cottonwoods out on the prairie, they tend to be around creeks or rivers. Um, I think sometimes we just think, oh, we should have cottonwoods, we should plant cottonwoods because we see them on the prairie and if they thrive on the prairie, then they'll thrive in our yard. But we forget that out on the prairie when we see them, they're growing along creeks and they're growing around rivers. And so they, they just need a lot of water um, and the same is true for aspens. Aspen um, also require lots of water. And then just another common problem that I see is the iron chlorosis and this is when um, or it can be recognized when our trees are kind of like a, a limey green color instead of a deep rich color or even the leaf itself is yellow with green veins and it has to do with how much iron is available in the soil um, sometimes related to our soil pH for um, the trees to be able to um, take up. And again, when I'm driving around in the community um, looking at trees, I can recognize this the most when I'm looking at aspens. Um, 
And this article, Aspen Cottonwoods Prone to Problems, it talks about a lot of these um, challenges more in depth. So sometimes um, we're not as fortunate to be able to pick the trees um, that we have in our landscaper garden. Sometimes we already have them. I actually have an aspen tree in my backyard that I inherited when I bought my property. And so just being aware of um, the different challenges that you might face is, I think, is a good thing, I think. So that's kind of a little bit of a <laughs> downer so far of um, the challenges and things to be thinking about. So um, this is sort of the take action piece and the tree selection and maybe selecting some trees that are um, well adapted for our landscape. So here are two of my favorite publications for talking about trees. This Landscaping um, Recommended Trees for Wyoming is a great publication. It has both evergreen and deciduous trees. It has their scientific name, common name, um, where they're going to be hardy, how big they get, if they're sun or shade, and then some additional comments. So these two trees towards the bottom in the additional comment line, it says that these can be good alternatives to aspen trees. So um, that might be something to consider if you just love those aspen trees in, in the mountains, um, but maybe just don't want to deal with those aspen challenges, maybe consider these trees. So this is a great um, publication. I want to say that it has like eight or nine pages of all kinds of different um, trees to consider because I think sometimes, um, yeah, we, we just need ideas of what to maybe plant instead. And then there's this publication, Scrappy Trees. And the reason, or I guess I should tell you a little bit about this publication. So um, it is written up about the Cheyenne Horticulture Field Station um, at the High Plains Grass Grasslands Research Station. Um, and these, I guess a bunch of educators had gone out on a tour and found these trees and came up with this publication based on their tour and walking around and looking at them. Um, a lot of these trees were planted between 1930 and 1950 when the uh, research station was kind of focused on more tree and vegetation things, but then the, the focus of the station changed to livestock and so the trees kind of got ignored. And so, um, the ed educators who put together this publication went around and took pictures of the trees and then there's a write-up similar to what was in that other publication about what they look like, um, their flowers, their hardiness. This one talks about disease and insect susceptibilities. Um, yeah, sort of that information that you would want to know when choosing. What I think is extra special about this publication is that it has an image of what that tree looks like right now. So this is basically like a picture of that tree. It hasn't been, it hasn't seen any extra um, care since it was planted or since that shift um, in the research station happened and it hasn't been pruned. And so this is kind of what the tree looks like in this ignored state. So, um, this little maple, I don't think that it's the most amazing looking maple I've ever seen, but if we switch over to this oak leaf mountain ash, I think that's a very nice looking tree and to know that it hasn't really been pruned or it hasn't seen any extra care to me is something that I'd want to consider when adding it to my landscape. And it doesn't mean that these other trees aren't good additions to your landscape, it just might mean that they'll actually need some attention. And so I like flipping through this um, publication and seeing the tree that um, are still beautiful with little attention, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, both of both those publications are great for um, going out and getting some ideas of what to plant and what's well suited. I enjoy talking about uh, trees or um, talking about maybe what solutions might uh, might be good for people. Definitely, if you have questions or concerns or just want to chat about trees, um, reach out. So here's my email and my phone number, and I'd love to chat.